Hi, my name is Max from Your Energized Mind and Body. And this morning we are with the lovely Melissa from Modern Movement here in Balgala on the Northern Beaches. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. This morning what we're going to do is we're going to talk about yoga. But not just yoga, flexibility and how you can sit, but we're going to talk about breath, meditation, mindfulness, and basically what all yoga is about. So, I'm going to ask a few questions <laughs> and uh, interested in your journey, journey on how yoga came into your life and probably the why. Yeah. Well, I'm originally, as you'll notice very quickly from my accent, from America. And I grew up in Idaho in the Rocky Mountains. And being an outdoor adventure mountain kind of person, everything that we did, everything that I did was about sports kayaking, rafting, and racing motorcycles. And <laughs> yeah, life has changed a lot. Um, and, and I was actually not very good at any of those sports, and so I crashed a lot. And in, the, in my career of riding motocross, I think I wound up with more than 10 concussions, broken bones, ankles, wrists, um, and a lot of other things. So fast forward a few years, and in college, I chose to study psychology and specifically the psychology of health. I was really interested in how the mind and the body work together, why certain things would make somebody equivocate to a healthy person or an unhealthy person. We know that sleep is important and we know that broken bones are not good, but I wanted to understand the deeper cause and effect of how all this came together in a more cohesive picture. Somewhere in about year two of studying psychology and believing myself to be studying health, I was having epileptic seizures and I was winding up in the hospital um, probably once or twice a month. Um, internal organs were failing and all sorts of pretty deep health issues which made me look really in a different direction on how I was thinking about health. And somebody said you should try yoga. So <laughs> my first yoga class, to be honest with you, was hell forward folding after never having done a stretch my whole life and after having broken bones and concussions and injuries and tight muscles from all of my sports, it was terrible. And if people talk about their first yoga class, like leaving immediately with this like light zen feeling and I was like, that sucks, I'm never doing that again. And everyone in the room being so good and knowing what they were doing, it was like a different language and I'll never forget that. But I also remember later in the evening, sometime hours afterwards, just feeling calm and being an adrenaline junkie and actually being diagnosed with an adrenaline disorder calm wasn't something that was a part of my normal waking life and so there was simply a spark of curiosity of what's this and is this something like is this a fluke or is this something that i could actually experience on a more ongoing basis so i decided that i would treat it just as an experiment without committing to do it and without thinking that it was going to be anything, just to keep trying. And when you allow curiosity to guide the way without expectation, it's really cool. And I was really surprised at how much I started to enjoy the practice. And once the physical pain started to deteriorate, and when just moving in a body wasn't as terrible, I really started to understand and to feel the other things. Just going about being alive as a human being, it became much easier. There was much less pain just waking in the morning. And I actually became much better at all of the activities that I was doing. I could ride my motorbike faster because I had more focus and I had clarity. I could paddle harder because my shoulders and my core were able to work better. So I very quickly um, fell in love with it. And I suppose we'll probably get into this a little bit later, but everything changed. And once I started moving down that change, I never wanted to go back to where I was before, to that pain and that lethargy and that fogginess and all of the, all of the craziness. So um, that would have been 16 years ago Ooh. that that started. And you must have started really young then. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's, that's the how, that's the when, and, and I suppose that's the why.
Oh, that's the one. And one of the, the things that you've mentioned was, was the, a lot of people don't use this word, but clarity. Mm. And, and, um, and I was guilty, I was always too hyper and everything else. And then eventually with my yoga journey, I became calmer. Yeah. And also with more clarity. Because you're calmer, you have more time and you're more mindful, hence clarity. Yeah. So that works quite well. Great. So then that was your yoga journey, practicing and then becoming a teacher, I'm, I'm assuming, of course. And now modern movement. Where does yeah. that come from? Well, I suppose I'll just quickly touch on the becoming a teacher part. Yes. I actually didn't want to be a teacher, not at all. I don't know if many people ever, ever like, you know, are growing up writing their diary like, I hope I grow up and become a yoga teacher one day. Like, definitely not. But I didn't know what I was going to do with my psychology studies. I knew that I was fascinated with the human organism and I loved understanding what people felt on a deeper level. And rather than just our waking hours and what happens as we move throughout the day, really understanding where that comes from. So I decided that I would do my teacher training only because it had made such a profound impact on my personal health. I forgot to mention this before, but I stopped having seizures. I stopped going in and out of the hospital. Inflammation went down, adrenaline disorder went down, kidneys came back online, liver went back online, and I just became a functioning human being, which is super great. And so I decided that I just wanted to understand more. And being a why person and a very curious person, I decided that I just wanted to understand deeper um, what yoga was and what the teachers knew that were helping me so much. So I decided to go to the source of yoga and I wound up in the Himalayas in India, a place called Rishikesh, which is allegedly where yoga started. And with no intention of becoming a teacher, just with the intention of learning and understanding. Um, I lived there and did my studies there and came back and one thing follows into the next and on accident I started teaching yoga and again never could go back. So a few years into teaching yoga, um, maybe five, um, I met a couple of really wonderful people on the northern beaches that had a vision that spoke to me deeply and they had created something already that was exactly in line with my values and my vision and what I wanted from yoga and what I wanted from my voice in yoga. So it became a very quick and beautiful relationship where they asked me to come on board and be a part of their family. Um, and so they already had modern movement. And so I was invited to just come in and enhance the vision, I suppose. So they had a first studio in Monabelle, which from where Max and I are sitting now, it's about 20 minutes. Um, and we wanted to grow that. Um, we were very fortunate with the first one that it was really well received by the community. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful symbiotic relationship of what they needed and what the studio needed and coming together to fulfill that. So we decided that we would allow that to continue to grow. So we opened here in Valgala and that's really when I um, stepped deeper into the picture. And I suppose to elaborate a little bit on what the picture is, there is so much yoga out there and there are so many yoga studios out there. And I loved this place and I loved what they had created because it gave the power and being, being athletic and being an adrenaline person myself, from my practice, I like to feel that there is something physical. And I really loved the entry point of the physicality, the body, in a yoga we call this the asana, which is the body movements. I like those to be strong and to be powerful because I think that a lot of our life requires this from us, to really feel embodied and powerful in, in our physical form. This was offered, and so I loved that. And there are a lot of yoga studios that offer the power, but I told you before, I'm a why person. It's not enough for me to just ride my motorcycle at 100 miles an hour, although it was for a while. Eventually, I had to start asking the questions of why. You know, where am I trying to go this fast? What am I trying to receive? And modern movement, the vision for it was not only the physical, but it was a really deep undercurrent of why. What's the purpose in the movement? And what can we enhance and what can we change through physical movement? And I really, really loved that it was these two things that I was so passionate about that could come together mm. and that I could be a voice in that, in the, dare I say, the psychology of yoga, which you may or may not always know is happening, but it's impossible to separate the brain or the mind from the body or the body from the mind. And modern movement is the blend of that. 
what we think and what we feel and how that comes together to craft who we are. So as a yoga studio, the differentiation in the vision and the creation, it's not just the strongest physical practice that you can get because we all have a really strong life and activities and sports and hobbies. So there's the undercurrent or I suppose that overarching why. Why would we want to embody um, intelligent and intrinsic movement? Why would we want to open the body? Why would we want to strengthen the body? And what is deeper than all that? What holds all of that? So that's, I suppose, modern movement and how I fell into it and what it is. That's interesting. <laughs> you said so many things that um, people can relate to. And uh, this one for me, it's uh, for me, yoga is as simple as connecting mind and body yeah. through breath. Yeah. And that's what modern movement is all about. Yeah. So because sometimes in life we we uh, we get stressed. You know, we, a <laughs> lot of people <laughs> often we live such busy lives, and we get stressed. We get um, we we always run out of time. You know, we, whether you you work for someone or you have your own business, then you get married. Congratulations, Thank Melissa you. just got married, <laughs> and then uh, and then you have kids, and it just adds on and on and on. And people are, are so because of such busyness, we're yeah. stressed. And the stress can cause so many mental and physical issues. Yeah. And this is why I'm gonna jump talking more about breath at this point because breathing is so simple, but yet not a lot of people do it properly, meaning they can breathe better. Yeah. What do you think, so, so the breathing, breathing, meditation, Mindfulness, yoga, they're all related, aren't they? Of course. So what's your, you know, when you, you, you teach people, when you explain breath, for example, how do you go about and what do you try for students or people to get out of it? Sure. Well, people ask sometimes, how important is breath? And my answer to that <clears throat> is close your eyes and hold your breath. See how long you last without it. That's how important it is. It, it is absolutely everything. <clears throat> if you can't breathe, you can't live. And in order to live well, you need to breathe well. This is something that I had heard so much, but my, my first very visceral experience of it, it was diving. And I'm not sure if you were a diver, Max. I imagine that you are. Um, being submersed underwater, it's an incredible feeling because it's almost out of body and everything is so out of context. And I will never forget learning how to breathe properly underwater. The only sound that you can hear is your breath. And you can hear soft, subtle sounds around you, but essentially like it is you and the breath in your ears. So you're very aware of your inhalation, your exhalation. So being a yogi, I was like, okay, cool. I'm down with this, I've got the breath. But we were swimming along the, the bottom of the seabed and there was just a large rock that we needed to just swim over. But with weights, you're constantly sinking down in the ocean and the only way to rise, to move over this rock, rock is to breathe in. And as your lungs expand, you become buoyant in the water. So the body rises, my body rose, and I moved over the rock and it was time to go back down. So I exhaled and as the lungs empty, you descend and you go down again. And I just thought, Wow, that's fucking cool. <laughs> the breath really can move me over anything. Mm -hmm. And I realized that not only was it just underwater moving over rocks or moving through taverns, it's exactly the same in my day-to-day -day life. When I have the rock in front of me, when I have an, a challenge that I need to rise above, the first thing to do is just to breathe and to just receive and to just fill. Because if I'm empty, I'll just sink and I'll just stay there on the bottom, unable to rise to the challenge or meet whatever it is energetically that I'm asked to do. As you said, there are so many stressors, running a business, being in traffic, living in Sydney, or being a human on planet Earth. There are these rocks essentially all the, every day, all day long. There are so many things that we need first to fill and to receive in order to have that within us that we need to react to the situation or whatever it is. So. <clears throat> 
I suppose taking that analogy and taking that metaphor, it can be as simple as just seeing what's in front of you, whatever the stressor is, if your child has just thrown lunch all over the floor, or you come around the corner to get to work and there's you know, a line of traffic and you know you're not gonna make it. It can simply just be breathing in. And it sounds so stupid in its simplicity until you actually embody it. And especially being somebody who had an adrenaline disorder, as I told you before, um, understanding the appropriate way to breathe in and to breathe out and how much you actually need and then how much you need to let go of. Breathing in is 50%. You know, sometimes when it feels like we're empty and we're depleted, we need an inhalation. But sometimes when we're super high strung, we're inhaling anyways. Mm. <laughs> it's that like really excited, anxious breath. And so we're constantly here. You know when it feels like everything is right at the top of your throat or everything is like about to explode? What you need is not an inhalation. What you need is an exhalation. You need to come back down when you're on the other side of that rock or when you're on the other side and it's time to just reground or it's time to just resettle. So I think when you're talking about the appropriation of breath, it's not only knowing how to receive deep nourishment, but it's also knowing when like, okay, traffic has passed, I'm at work, I've made it to wherever I needed to be on time. This hard conversation, I've had it now, I've hung up the phone, and it's time now for a long exhale and to let go. And because we're talking about form, we're talking about the body, and we're talking about earth, we're talking about kids, stressors, weddings, whatever it is that's happening, the breath is the bridge. Mm -hmm. it's, it's from form to formless. And it's the one thing that you don't need to carry with you. You don't need a tool. You have the breath within you all the time. And it's that tap that you can turn on and off that will connect you to whatever the situation is or whatever the person is around you. Um, and I think for that, it's so important to realize that whatever you need, you have it already. If you need more, take more. If you need to let go, let go more. Um, so in that sense, something that is the most subtle and the most simple, it's the most profound and often overlooked because of that. I totally agree. And, and uh, for me, I was, still am, really, really uh, super active and uh, really got anxious quickly, got stressed. Well, I got anxious, anxious quickly and... Um, and basically, I wasn't breathe. I was doing the shallow breathing. So yeah. as we get stressed or frustrated or anxious, we just take shorter breaths. Yeah. And and what is great for me is I used to do this, and then through yoga, and breathing, slowing down, mindfulness. Now it's interesting because for me, if I get anxious or stressed, something happens out of my control. Instead of my shallow breathing and. I just, I actually automatically breathe deeper and slower and all the way down and all the way back out. And automatically it calms me down. So whatever the situation, I can calm down and then deal with whatever the stress is about. Yeah. And that is so important. This is why we, we talk about breath, we talk about yoga, it's to slow down Slow down the mind, and then that will relax and slow down the body, yeah. and then you can move on and, and, and get on with what you've got to do. So that's great on the breath, and, and it's so important. Um, now, for the people out there, for normal people, well, I think we've talked about why they should probably start doing yoga. Mm. Um, when do we start doing yoga? <laughs> Five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting. So many times, being a yogi myself, yogis will flock to a yoga room quite easily and quite quickly. Mm -hmm. The people who won't come to a yoga studio are the people who need it the most. But their answer or their thought process is always, I'm not flexible enough to go to yoga. <laughs> I can't breathe well enough to go to yoga. And there's a famous quote that I hope you've heard. Saying I'm not flexible enough for yoga is like saying I'm too dirty to have a bath. It's, mm. it's the why, you know. Those of us who are the most unwell or who are the most unflexible or uncoordinated or those of us who are just straight up too busy, we need it the most. 
And when I look back in my own evolution, the time that I was too unwell to physically move my body to go to yoga, or the days that I'm just way too high strung and I have way too much on to make 60 minutes for yoga, those are the days that it's non-negotiable. That is when we need it the most. It's when we're at the low. It's not when we're at the high. It's not when we are optimal and fully functioning human beings. Like, of course we need it then. But that's when it's going to happen anyways. Like increases like, and the opposite heals. We're often addicted to what we're doing already. But the thing that's the opposite of what we already have, there's no way we want to go there. And if yoga feels like the opposite of what you want or what you have time for or what you're capable for, that's what you need the most. You know, it's just like that metaphor, that quote before, when you are sodden and muggy, muddy and sweaty and disgusting, that's when you need a bath the most, <laughs> you know, like that's the opposite of where you are, but that's what's going to bring you back to the, what, what you need to be. So I suppose the quicker or the shorter answer to the question is that we all need yoga, but because yoga is so vast and because it's such a world of infinite possibility, there's a different yoga for everybody. And whether your yoga is the breath or whether your yoga is something that's very strong and powerful, the opposite for you is going to be different than it is for Max and it's going to be different than it is for me. We each, I suppose, need to look at where we are now, where we need to go. And just like we spoke before about the breath being the bridge, your yoga is going to be the bridge that will take you into the opposite of where you are now. Um, so we need yoga right now <laughs> and we need yoga every day in whatever form it's going to be because it will change form for every person and for every day depending on the needs individually of the, of the person. That's right. And being mindful, you know, just being in the present because what's happening nowadays is we're, we're basically human doings, we're not human beings. And this is when slowing down, whether, um, you know, we talk about meditation as well. Meditation could be, it's not just about sitting down a certain way with candles and in and, and the darkness <laughs> and whatnot. Meditation is just basically, if you can just, just be and let the stuff come in, but don't analyze it. Just let it flow. And whether that could be just walking, it could be just sitting there looking at the water. It could be just, just sitting by yourself listening to music. There's all kinds of meditation that, yeah. that we can take. So, for yoga, you mentioned briefly different types of yoga. Yeah. So we often hear about um, vinyasa, flow, yin, and whatnot. So uh, here at Modern Movement, uh, what are the uh, type of yogas we practice? Yeah, we have a few, but probably best to focus on what we're known for. Mm -hmm. um, our signature style is called vinyasa, it's a heated vinyasa and vinyasa is essentially one breath and one movement and we've spoken before about the breath and the fact that it is the underpin of everything. To, to move through asana without breath, it's like trying to move through a day holding your mouth, like eventually you'll faint or you'll die <laughs> and yoga is the same. Um, and I love vinyasa, I think speaking before about my athletic background, I love moving um, and I love the athleticism and the physicality. So we, we combine this, the movement and the physical with the breath, so with the subtle body. So you have the strong body and the subtle body that move together in unison. And it creates, my, my master taught it to me as perfection in action. And it doesn't mean perfection as in the perfect alignment it simply means doing one thing at one time with 100% of you, which is the same with meditation. Whether you're just driving your car, you're 100% driving the car, whether you're just doing the dishes, you're just 100% doing the dishes. And I love that thought on meditation of, it doesn't have to be candles and sitting down, it's just doing one thing with a one-pointed focus. That's vinyasa. It's movement with a one-pointed focus. So it's meditation through the physical body. As fast as you're breathing, so too are you moving. So as you're inhaling, you're doing something. And as you're exhaling, you're doing something else. So you will know very quickly when you're not breathing as you're moving because one of them will suffer. <laughs> whether it's shaking or whether it's fatigue, 
Um, but when you can find that symbiotic relationship between I am breathing and I am standing, and I am exhaling and I am bowing forward, there's a buoyancy and there's a continuation of energetic flow, which it sounds silly, but when you've experienced that, even if it's just when you've experienced flow surfing, or if you've experienced flow running, or if you've experienced flow composing artwork or playing the piano, it becomes effortless. It's just, it, you no longer have to require decision or thought or struggle. And that's vinyasa. Mm -hmm. It's just movement without effort. As much energy as you're expending through moving your arms and legs and challenging poses, so too are you receiving that same energy from breath. Right. That's vinyasa to me. <laughs> That's right. And, and on vinyasa, a lot of people, funny, uh, I'll say to some friends, oh, you, should, you know, maybe you should try yoga. And they say, yeah, maybe I should because everyone that does yoga and vinyasa seem to be fit. So obviously we talked about flow, movement, you know, one movement, one breath. Um, but it, for the core and the body, yeah. it's excellent, isn't it? Yeah. And it's interesting you say this. Um, because a lot of times we look at yoga and it feels like we want to go to yoga so that we can get the butt, so we can get the abs, so that we can get the strong arms. All of these things are symptoms of yoga, but they're not the yoga. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, but they happen as a result of or as an accident of, which is a great thing because it's a, bonus. You, <laughs> it's a total it's bonus. A good bonus. You go in there. Um, and do you know what? I want to say that quickly. Like, even if you go in there for the butt, or even if you go in there for the abs, like, ancient day yogis will kill me for saying this, but like, that's okay. It's totally okay. It's a Western world. <laughs> it's a Western world, and it's a real world. And I've seen it happen so many times. I used to teach yoga in a gym, and everybody was there just for the physical practice. And there were a lot of athletes who would come in straight after weightlifting, you know, they'd cool and just for a stretch. And I was like, awesome, we're just gonna stretch you out. It, to me, it doesn't matter. You know, it's kind of like the, the arms of yoga are wide open. And whatever gets you in the door, whatever your personal goal or need is, you'll receive that. But on accident, you're gonna start getting all of the other benefits as well. So sometimes, you know, for those of us that came there, as we said, for the clarity or for the mind stuff, the accidental benefit was the physicality. Strong core, more flexible range of motion through the body, um, an ability to do our sports or to perform better. But on the adverse, if you're coming in for the physicality, you will get that. And the accident will be the focus and it will be the clarity. <laughs> That's excellent. That's so true. And that leads us to, now, a lot of individuals do yoga. But what we see more and more now is that we see yoga, meditation, mindfulness slowing down in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And we see it as well with athletes. And I'm talking about professional athletes at high level, um, also with the high Im impact sports such, such as rugby yeah. and, and boxing. Yeah. Because it's, it's, a good it's a good mix to throw in your your hard training because sometimes you could do a really hard training session and then it's that transition you know from going hard for a long time to then how do you transition to become calm again that's for athletes same thing in business corporate you know we're in business you're at the office and you, all day you're going hard or you're, you're really you're using your mind your brain a lot just like an athlete would use the um, the body and then we need to transition to coming home or whatnot. Yeah. So what's your opinion with the, let's just start with the corporate world. Um, a good example here that I might throw in is uh, I'm Canadian and originally and uh, I know a police force in Canada every morning they start with meditation so there will be 20 plus officers sitting however they sit doesn't matter you can sit uh, however you feel comfortable and they basically they meditate yeah. for about 20 minutes and then they go on with their day too because they never know what's coming or going. So it's a good way. And even schools, I think schools in the US, um, they're, they're starting students in problem schools. Yeah. So those are certain areas and what's coming, uh, coming with, uh, with that meditation, yoga and mindfulness. So in the corporate world, um, how can we help the corporate to you know, perhaps team building or workshops? Is that how we can help people in, as a group, perhaps? 
Certainly. And I think to reiterate something that you said and something we spoke about before, which was this concept of like increases like and the opposite heals. And when we're talking about the corporate world, what we see and what I see the most, um, having lived in that world myself, is the busyness. And the busyness leads to more busyness, which leads to more busyness. And the commitments lead to more commitments, which lead to more commitments and responsibility. And as we move up the corporate ladder and as we become more and more important, we expand more in what's expected of us. And therefore, I believe, um, our personal stress levels. And it just continues on this one pointed path. And the opposite is what brings that back into symbiotic. Um, and so the, you know, your, our CEOs and the people who are driving these businesses, if they're constantly just looking in one direction, taking inhale breath and inhale breath and inhale breath and inhale breath, busy, 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 crazy, 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 it only goes for so far before the body physically snaps. Mm -hmm. And before yoga ever happened, we were studying this in my psychology degree, how much physical stress the brain can take. And you touched this before, and in our studies, it was that 95% of all physical decay and disease is caused from mm. the brain. So studying psychology, it was really about the biomechanics of how the cellular structure of the brain impacted the rest of the body. And I love that now I can have the same conversation through a yoga lens, but I have the confidence and understanding of its scientific backing. And from a corporate world, when we're talking about stress and we're talking about how to tonify and how to like ground ourselves down again, I think the most important thing to say is that we absolutely must. If we continue going down the like increases like and allowing ourselves to be living in that high functioning, stressful, adrenaline driven world, the mind snaps or the body snaps one of the two absolutely will. So before that, I think it's about listening to the body's whispers rather than waiting for the scream when you end up hospitalized with a heart attack or a stroke, which is usually when people come to see me when it's too late. Um, but hopefully you, we can craft tools so that people start recognizing, being able to just feel that heart flutter, you know, of like going in before a quarterly review of like, oh my God, you know, that anxious feeling or just after a huge presentation of a, how do we find these moments where we are at our peak for adrenaline or for performance or whatever that is and how to find the balance, how to find then what's necessary to come back down. So I think when we're talking now about how, how we touch this world, and how the work that you and I have found profound and beneficial for ourselves, how that moves into this next chapter. You spoke before about some companies taking it on as a policy and some schools taking it on as a practice. I think it starts first from an individual experience. So for anybody who sees this, if you do work in a corporate environment, if you run a team, if you're part of a team, if you run a business or you're part of a business, start with yourself first. Mm -hmm. Have a personal experience of what it feels like in your body to just move, what it feels like to just breathe. Mm -hmm. Because nobody can teach it to you. We can guide you, but you are the teacher. Mm -hmm. And if you want to impact the rest of a corporation or the rest of a team or the rest of even just a family or a partnership, it starts first from just understanding why. And again, I told you I'm a why person but you can't teach it or you can't share it unless you know that it's true. So any of these people who have brought it into their school or bought it into their business already, I'm sure it's because they felt it for themselves and they were passionate enough to share it with the rest of whomever is around them. So I would say that if you don't already, just create or co go to whatever studio is close or near to you and have a physical experience of yoga and then have a subtle experience of breath and um, the soft body and the mind of yoga. And if it touches you the way it touches almost everybody mm. else who practices it, make a small step. How do you sit down, even if it's just at home with your children and share with them? How do you sit down with your partner? My partner is, or was, before three knee surgeries, uh, a top, really, really good rugby player. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, he's not now because of the physicality. And it took a long time for us to be able to share the softer 
um, the softer breath practices for somebody who, like him, is very athletic, very tight, very sore, to then be able to move through the physical practices. But it was because I knew what it would change that he was able to kind of live that vicariously through me until he was willing to take it on. And to see him share it with the rest of his rugby team because he knew for himself the benefits of it. And I think that's it, it's the ripple. Mm -hmm. And as we wanted to go into the corporate world, and as we wanted to go and affect, you know, what if the government was doing this, you know, and what if before making um, a worldwide decision, what if like all of our politicians sat down and just meditated together? And what if they just had an inner knowing of their own body and of their own world before picking up the phone and deciding whether or not there was going to be a bomb strike? If we want the ripple to go that far, I think it has to start first with the stone that we're throwing and understanding for our own self what the point is. Definitely. Does that answer the question? <laughs> it, it does. And two, two key words here I think you said is, is awareness. Okay, because once we become aware of, you know, we're busy, busy, or we're not feeling good mentally or physically, so um, this is when we can start making changes. But if we're not aware, yeah. and a lot of people aren't, or probably simply just don't want to be aware, yeah. right? And then to the balance. I like balance as well, and this is where in life we need to have a bit of balance. So to be aware first, and then the balance. And as you said, everything starts from within. From within. So ourself, we start from within. We try things, and hopefully we can share. This is what yoga teachers do. This is what we're doing now. We're sharing with you um, this experience. So you've touched the corporate world, and you've. you've Touch the professional athletes as well. You, you mentioned your partner, your husband, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's exactly right, isn't it? So in, in, in such a pressured environment to perform mentally and physically, because obviously physically they do in rugby, they do have to perform and, and other sports as well. But at the end of the day, the mental is so important as well. Um, so I think that professional athletes and teams are starting to understand and they're starting to prioritize and budgetize mm -hmm. such um, as part of the training, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And, and again, it's, it's what we said before, that like increases like and we need the opposite. And with athletes, it's incredible because, and having been here myself, I can speak to this, we think that we just need to be stronger, faster, better. You know, and if you think about even just like the mechanics of something we can all understand of even just the musculature of the body. If you think about, you know, just a bicep. If you were to go to the gym and just bicep curl and bicep curl and bicep curl and bicep curl and bicep curl. Some guys do that. I know. Okay. <laughs> Bless them. And then they pop them in and I see them. <laughs> you know, if you think about just contracting and contracting and contracting and contracting, the muscle fibers just become dense and dense and dense and dense. And we're only doing the one thing. And your body can do that for a period of time. But what we need then is the opposite. So that for me is what the yoga is. Not for me, that, that's what the yoga is. Yeah. It's, the, it's the lengthening. It's, it's creating space so that you, when you again choose to contract and when you gotta go to the gym and stand in front of the mirror and do your next bicep curl, you have a deeper capacity because the musculature now knows its opposite range as well. And from the physicality of the body, it increases your performance to do what you're already doing better. And the same thing, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be with strength. It does enhance the body's ability to, to, to strengthen. But it also, if, you're, if your sport or if your performance is more about endurance or is more about length. Um, again, we work, with, we work with endurance athletes for, that are runners, that are swimmers, that are cyclists. The most important thing is to be able to breathe. <laughs> Constantly and continuously to be able to breathe. Yep. And to keep replenishing the body so that the muscles can keep firing. And in, or if your sport is something like surfing or it requires range of motion, if it's golf, if it's tennis, the more supple and the more fluid the body actually is, the more range you have to strike harder or to strike better or to move faster. So it's interesting, you know, because the, the yin and the yang, we think that it's all the yang, it's all the power. Like in order to lift more weight, I just need to lift more weight. And then tomorrow I'll lift more weight and the day after that lift more weight than that. In order to run faster, I just need to keep running faster. But the opposite is true. You need to stop <laughs> yeah. and it requires that lengthening or it requires that rest and it requires that replenishment and it's awesome that our peak athletes and as you said our sports teams and the leaders of are starting to really understand the physical and the biomechanical benefits of doing this 
and in that rest and recovery mode to insert something that puts more fluidity into the joint sides, something that puts more range and more capacity into the musculature. Athletes can perform better and they can do their job better. And you know, if, or and it's the adverse is true as well. Sometimes for yogis, we think that if we keep stretching and keep stretching and keep stretching, we'll just become more and more flexible. But no matter what you're doing, you have to do the opposite as well. You know, you have to stop stretching at some point and come to say a vinyasa class, which also would then put strength into the muscles. Um, so for whatever body or for whatever athlete or for whatever sport, it doesn't matter. Different styles of yoga will give you or me or you whatever it is that we need to bring our body back into its optimum and its peak performance to do what it is we want to be doing. That's excellent. And uh, creating space. I like the way you use creating space because we create space physically, but we create space mentally. And this is where the, the mindfulness, not the human doing and not the human being, and then just the meditation, which is just relaxing, being here yeah. and just just flowing is, is so important. So I hope, Melissa, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I hope this was, uh, this was good for you sharing. It's always good to share knowledge yeah. because this is how we can hopefully uh, not, not educate, but influence or maybe motivate you to give it a go. Yeah. Because as you said, you just got to start yourself try it yourself and uh, careful because you might really really like it and, and it might make a big difference in your life. Absolutely. Thanks for having me Max. Melissa, namaste. <laughs> namaste. Thank you very much. <laughs>